Hello, uh, good morning, astronomy students. Um, at least I'm recording this in the morning. This is uh, roughly 9.30 on March 19th, 2020. So we're, again, we're on day four of our digital learning. And um, today we are going to go over uh, the new lesson that's on there. And again, today you're not working through a Nearpod. You're going to be reading through the PowerPoint and then participating in um, a discussion topic that's you know you can find the link to it on eclass and um but anyway i wanted to just kind of go over firstly a couple of quick announcements reminders that sort of thing and i'm actually going to be breaking the lesson down into two videos today i think that's going to be more manageable for files and whatnot on my end um but i'm going to go ahead and move to present so that you all can see what it is i'm talking about and again, first, I'm just going to take us to our astronomy e-class page. And it looks like I'm presenting now, so that's good. Um, so, you know, you've got your uh, announcement post for the day right here. Uh, it does mention, like, you know, it says right here that I'm going to be recording another voiceover. That's what I'm doing right now. Again, depending on how long the video takes to process, um, that'll kind of dictate when I'm able to put it on the website later this morning, hopefully before lunch. But um, one thing I wanted to point out is if you go to the just the assignment link for the for the day, it gives you some again some important reminders, and some of those other than just the new stuff for the day. Um, we, you know, I tried uh, having a Google Meet help session yesterday afternoon. Um, we didn't have anybody attend, so I'm not going to plan on one today. But if I get some feedback before noon that some of you are interested, we'll go ahead and you know um, schedule one, and I'll post a link for us to meet between two and three. Um, now, if there's a different time, that'll be better for some of you. I can consider that. But uh, anyway, one other thing I posted and emailed about yesterday was there is a PBS uh, documentary that's free online. It's also on Netflix called Black Hole Apocalypse, and it's from the PBS Nova series that's been going on forever. It's a very long uh, standing show. But um, you should have started watching it yesterday. It is almost two hours. That's why I say started watching it, because you don't need to have completed watching it until tomorrow. Um, part of our work tomorrow will be dealing with. Uh, and going over that video. So hopefully if you didn't start yesterday, do that sometime today. Um, and I also really recommend if you have access to the movie Interstellar um, and the time to watch it, do watch that as well. Um, I might be able to show uh, the relevant scenes that we need to focus on from it um, on E-Class. I might be able to record and post those. I'm going to look into that. But um, if you, again, if you have the means to watch it on your own, please do so. It's not, I don't think, easily available for free streaming right now, but maybe you own it already or have a friend who does. I don't know. But if you can watch it, watch it. Um, again, just make sure you're caught up on the assignments from the last couple of days. And another big thing is, again, we had originally planned, um, well, at least as of last week, we were planning to test today. Um, that's what we were talking about last week, but obviously that is not going to be a good uh, thing to do because we're not totally done with the lessons. We'll mostly be finished with the lessons tomorrow when we get to black holes themselves. And um, so we're going to shoot for actually testing next either Thursday or Friday here on E-Class. Again, you've taken a few E-Class based quizzes for me before, like actual quizzes where I've had you do them in the classroom while I monitor you. And um, it will kind of be the same sort of process, just that, um, you know, you won't be able to take it in a classroom with me. So um, more details about that next week. But um, that also means that next week we'll include a day that's doing, you know, you're doing nothing but review, which there's a lot of material in this unit. So there'll be a lot to work on for that. But um, we also, there's a few other things, a few other uh, interactives and assignments I want you all to work on early next week um, once we have finished all the new material this week. All right. So um, one other thing I want to point out, I mentioned that Black Hole Apocalypse video. The main host of that video, and I'll just go ahead and open the link real quick. Let me open a new window. That's what you would do on your end as well. It's, um, it's hosted by a, an astrophysicist in New York um, named Jana Levin, and that, that's her there. And again, that's the video. Um, and what's interesting is I actually, I know two people who are 
sort of, you know, at least uh, have had something to do with her. Um, one of two, of, two of my good friends, um, one of which he's a, a musician up in New York. He, um, one of the friend, one of his other fellow musicians he's gone on tour with is actually the husband of Jan 11. Um, and I got to meet him, uh, uh, April last year. That's the last time, uh, my friend, the musician came down and, um, and this is Jan 11's Twitter account, by the way, you can take a look at it if you want to She us post some interesting stuff. But, um, another friend of mine who I've known for quite a while since elementary school, he, um, he helped build her office up there in New York at the pioneer works facility. You can see that link right here. Um, that's one of the facilities she helps, uh, you know, run or participate in. But anyway, I just want to kind of throw that information out there. It's kind of interesting. But um, yeah, we will go ahead and get along with the lesson. And again, I'm going to break this down into two parts. We're going to go through um, partway through special relativity for this first part of the video. And then we'll, in the second video, we'll pick up with the end of special relativity and talk about general, general relativity. So go ahead and move to slideshow mode so you can pretty clearly see what's going on. And of course, there's our title slide, again, just telling us what AKS we're dealing with. And again, if you look at the AKS themselves, they don't uh, specifically call out relativity, but you know we're talking about black holes as part of AKS 8C2, and you can't really understand the black holes without getting into relativity, special relativity and general relativity. So we'll start with a really brief intro for black holes. Um, again, we'll talk way more about them tomorrow. Um, again, if you have, you know, yesterday we were talking about neutron stars. Um, a neutron star is formed from the core of a red, uh, usually a red, maybe, maybe something else, but a super giant star that has a mass somewhere between uh, 1.4 and 3 solar masses. And we talked about the fact that if the core was, in fact, above 3 solar masses, you were going to end up um, the, the neutron degeneracy pressure force that can keep the neutron star stable. If it's above 3 solar masses, that, that force will just buckle. And gravity will completely crush the star. And it, it crushes it to the point where all of the mass of the core is now... Uh, forced down to take up zero space or volume. And that's when we have this idea of a black hole. Um, and let me, let me turn on our laser pointer here so we can also, again, just kind of point things out. So again, like it says here, it takes up no space or zero volume. And of course, you know, black holes are one of the big ticket items in astronomy as far as, uh, you know, churning up interest. People um, always ask questions about black holes. I really honestly kind of hate that we can't, that we're, that we're not in the classroom for this lesson. So that's, um, you know, I, again, I am still open to us holding a, a Google Meet session for those of you who really want to discuss this topic of relativity and, again, tomorrow, black holes specifically, because um, maybe you do have a lot of questions and maybe I don't fully address it in this video or in the PowerPoint. So, again, we can look at that. Um, so, like I said, relativity, to fully understand black holes, we need to look at relativity. And there's a few different things that Einstein, of course, Albert Einstein, he's the, the scientist, the physicist who developed these theories. There's a few things he has to tell us about them. And again, a lot, uh, one thing that some people don't realize is that, uh, again, there's actually two laws of relativity there, and they have different things that they address. Um, we have the special theory of relativity and the general theory of relativity. And we're going to look at special relativity first. And if we break it down, it, Einstein, in, with, with special relativity, he has seven main things that we need to be aware of for the scope of our course. And, you know, again, all of these topics, I'm giving you sort of the bare bones, uh, glossed over version just for the information that's pertinent to what we would need to understand for the course, for the scope of our course. You can get way more in depth with these topics, of course. And I've actually... Um, if you go to my, my new YouTube page where these videos are hosted, um, I've also put together some playlists where you can see uh, some other folks' videos on these topics where some, some of them do get more in-depth, some of them not too far, but again, like Professor Dave Explains, who we've used him in class before, and a few other examples. They have some great videos that you can find there. So uh, with, with uh, the first point for special relativity is just about the speed of light and how it's, it's a very important value. It's not just a speed like the speed of sound is. In physics right now, we're actually, that's one of the things we're getting into is the speed of sound waves and how 
Um, it's actually, it's fast compared to how fast, like say you or, you or I could go just running, you know, down the track or something. But, um, compared to light, it, it's a, it doesn't compare, uh, the speed of sound in air, you know, uh, here on earth can be measured in, um, the hundreds of miles per hour or meters per second. Again, in meters per, per second is about 340 meters per second, um, at sea level, um, through air. But the speed of light, as you can see here, which again, one thing you want to really know, just kind of have in your head that's automatically associated, is that when you when you hear speed of light, um, you want to be able to bring up the letter C in your mind because that's the that's the symbol we use for the mathematical value. It equals th um, three hundred million, or three times ten to the eighth meters per second. And just so you know, that's actually a rounded value. It's actually a little bit less than that. It's um, about 299 and some change million uh, meters per second. But this is usually the term you see thrown about. So but if you see something a little bit less, that's why. Don't be surprised by that. And you'll, you'll actually see another example of that here in the lesson. So again, it's the, ma the maximum possible speed for matter or for energy through space and time in the universe. Um, and what's interesting about the speed of light is it's always going to have the same value for all observers, regardless of their own velocity or inertial frame of reference. And we'll come back to inertial frames here in just a minute. Um, a, a good example, which is you know demonstrated here in the little illustration, is if you had something other than light that can go really fast, like a bullet fired from a, a handgun. Um, here in this example, you've got someone driving a car. Well, they're in the passenger seat, so I guess they're not the driver, um, which is probably a good thing. Um, but anyway, they're they're riding in the car, which the car is going at 100 kilometers per hour. And then they fire a bullet that relative to the people in the car's perspective, that bullet is going 1000 kilometers per hour, which is pretty fast. Um, and uh, it's going to be fast relative to the, the driver and the rider in the car. But um, to the observer you see standing over here, who's just standing still relative to the car the bullet appears to go even faster. It, it actually takes on the sum of the velocities of the bullet itself, which is 1000 kilometers per hour, and the velocity of the car relative to the observer, which is 100 kilometers per hour. So the observer, when they look at the bullet, they see if they had like a speedometer, um, a radar gun, something like that, sorry, um, they would record the bullet is moving at 1100 or 1100 kilometers per hour even though relative to the, the the car rider and driver it's not going that fast it's actually going a little bit slower from their perspective but if again that's with a, a bullet a bullet again it's a it's made of matter it takes energy to propel um it to to give it to any velocity and with light if you use light as your projectile in this case um then you get a very different result and here the scenario instead of a car we have a spaceship which can go really fast this is much faster than any spaceship we've ever actually developed. It's saying it can go at 0.1 C, meaning one tenth of the speed of light. So that would be 30 million meters per second instead of 300 million meters per second. Um, and if they were firing or shining a light beam or a laser um, you know, out of the front of their ship, the bow of their ship, just straight ahead of them, then that light beam, if they recorded the speed of that light, they would record it as C, that three times 10 to the eighth meters per second value. And then if you had an, an astronaut observer standing over here, you know, on their own little space station or whatever, as this spaceship and its light beams zip by, they would also record the velocity of light as that same value of three times 10 to the eighth meters per second. They would not have that the spaceship crew and the bystander astronaut, they would not have different measurements for the speed of light here, they would observe and record the same thing. Unlike with our car driver and rider and the um, static bystander observing the bullet, they would have different um, velocity recordings. All right, so that's the first point from special relativity. The speed of light is the same value and it's also the maximum velocity for anything moving through space and time. Now, by the way, one sort of exception to this, it's not really an exception, is that space itself can actually move faster than the speed of light. That's something we'll come back to at the end of the school year when we talk about cosmology and the beginnings of the universe, the Big Bang, and how the universe would have increased in size over time. Um, so that that's it sounds like an exception that something can move faster than the speed of light. But when we say that, that things don't move faster than the speed of light, we mean things moving through space, not necessarily the movement of space itself, which is a weird idea that we'll come back to. All right, second point for special relativity. 
There is no absolute state of rest and no absolute frame of reference. And here Einstein tells us that everything is in motion. And even uh, if that motion has to be relative to something that does not appear to move. So for example, like right now I'm sitting on our couch. Um, I'm not moving relative to the couch. The couch is not moving relative to the room. The house is not moving relative to the ground. So everything seems to be relatively motionless, except for maybe me, because you know, I'm talking, moving my hands around and so forth. Um, but, in fact, of course, all of these things are moving and they're all kind of moving together. That's why they don't seem to move relative to me. The couch is moving along with the house as the earth rotates, as the earth orbits the sun and so forth. We'll come back to that in, on the next slide. There's, there's nested frames of reference. But because of this, um, because of this fact that everything is moving in reality, um, and, and we kind of know this, we, you know, we, we remember some of the things we learn about basic you know, astronomy facts, we learn again that the earth is orbiting the sun, things like that. Um, and we kind of just tend to ignore that when we are dealing with everyday life. Um, and we and we call this the use of inter inertial frames of reference, not internal, that's inertial, as in inertia, um, you know, the, your physics concept. But it says um, we use inertial frames of reference to make sense of the world in terms of motion. Perhaps the most basic inertial frame is the ground. We typically say something is moving if we can see it moving relative to the ground. So, you know, Again, you are, you know, just uh, maybe you're walking uh, down the sidewalk and you see a, or actually say you're on the sidewalk and you stop moving. That's, that's better for this example. And you see a car go down the street. You know it, the car is moving because you can see it moving relative to the ground. The ground appears to stay still while the car continues to keep going. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily just have to be the ground here. There's lots of other things too, you know, like trees, you know, of course they're rooted to the ground. So they'll also have the same basic um, inertial frame as the ground. Um, if you are a different one though, it could be like if you're watching an airplane or a helicopter fly across the sky, maybe there's some very slow moving clouds that appear to be relatively motionless. Maybe it's not a very windy day and you can tell by the lack of motion of those clouds that the airplane or helicopter is moving. Or maybe it's at night and you can see the lights from the airplane and they move compared to the relatively motionless background stars. All of these things are things that can work as inertial frames. Now, that being said, all of our inertial frames, for us to use them, they need to be something that is around us. Because um, as a counter example, uh, our inertial frame can be something that is in fact moving. Again, if I look at the ground, it doesn't seem to move compared to me. But if I get in the car and the car starts driving down the road, maybe I'm driving or I'm a passenger, either way, um, then compared to me, the car doesn't seem to move. I'm sitting there in the, in the car seat and, you know, I'm, the car doesn't, you know, slip out from under me or anything like that. Um, it, it's, I move with the car and I can move around within the car. And from my perspective, the car doesn't seem to really go anywhere. Instead, the environment around the car seems to move past us. Um, again, car or trees zip by uh, out the side window. Um, you know, if, if it's raining, the raindrops kind of zip toward the windshield, that sort of thing. So again, from the perspective of within the car, that car now becomes my inertial frame instead of the ground or trees, again, something about something like that, because all of those things, the ground and the trees and so forth, they now appear to be the things that are moving instead of my immediate environment of the car. And as a just sort of similar example here, it says, imagine you're driving around in the backseat of the car or not driving the backseat, but you're moving in the backseat of the car, like literally you're moving around. Like you're, you know, getting something from the floorboard or, you know, you're readjusting your seats, um, your position, anything like that. You're literally moving within the car and the driver tells you to sit still. That's a sensical statement. That makes sense. You know that they mean that they want you to stop moving within the car. But now let's imagine you're sitting perfectly still. And this is now like the little cartoon image here. You're, you're sitting perfectly still in the back seat while the car is traveling at 70 miles an hour or something. And you hear someone standing on the side of the road yell at you, hey, sit still. That wouldn't really make any sense to you. You are sitting still from your perspective within your inertial frame of reference. Um, you know, compared to compared to the car, you aren't moving. But compared to the, the static bystander who's just kind of getting standing on the side of the road or whatever, you are going quite fast, you know, again, roughly 70 miles an hour or something. So it's a sensible statement for them but not really for you because you have different inertial frames of reference. 
All right, so um, third major point from special relativity. Space and time are not really separate dimensions. Um, and, and sort of the, the counter example of this, uh, you, you know, you, you're familiar with the term 3D. In fact, we, we even brought that up in yesterday's lesson talking about volume and three-dimensional space. And we, we say that, we say 3D because in, you know, in terms of uh, like geometry, for example, one dimension means something that can only go two directions relative to, you know, a line, like say just left and right or just up and down, just those two directions. Um, two dimensional means something that can move in uh, a lot of directions, but only on a flat plane. So, you know, say up, down, left, right, um, and the diagonal directions in between. Uh, if you've ever heard of the book Flatland, it kind of gets into this sort of stuff. It's, it's worth a read. Um, but um, so, yeah, again, two dimensional like area. You know, if you calculate area and geometry, length times width, that's it. There's no third dimension there. And so but if we introduce the third dimension, we now have volume 3D space and that's length times width times height. Um, and then we often treat time. Time is often described as a fourth dimension that can allow things in the first second or third dimension to change and go through different processes. Einstein goes back and, and um, by the way, that, that description that um, those different levels of dimensions, first, second, third, fourth for time, that very much uh, goes pretty well with Newton's idea of physics, what we call classical physics. But Einstein introduces a physics where that sort of thinking doesn't really make any sense. He says that, okay, not only uh, are, you know, is it, not completely realistic to describe space as existing in three different levels of dimensions, first, second, and third, and then se separating time from those. He says that time and space altogether is in fact one thing. A lot of times you, uh, if you've ever watched any sort of you know, science fiction kind of stuff, maybe you've heard of the space time, the fabric of space time, things like that. That's kind of what he means. Although, you know, that when you say it's fabric of space time, that's a much, you know, it's very simplified um, compared to what Einstein's really talking about. Um, and this fact, th that fact that, um, well, actually, let me go back. It says here, so the fact that space and time are really one thing, space time, that's what we call it together. It, this means that any changes to the shape of space are also going to cause changes in how time works. And this is going to have a bigger implication in the next video part when we talk about general relativity, um, and very much dictates how black holes are going to work. A simple example of this whole space-time idea is that time, and I say simple in quotation marks here, again, with the Big Bang, with you know what astronomers know about the beginning of the universe, the universe as a whole was much smaller at that point than it was now. And one kind of a consequence of space and time affecting each other as one thing is that if you have a smaller amount of space, like literally a smaller universe, then time is going to pass at a different rate in that smaller universe than it does in a larger universe that we experience currently. And um, so you'd have actually, as the universe developed and changed and grew, um, the uh, ability for time to pass also itself changed. And again, I, I'm really glossing over that, but just, that's just sort of an example of what we're talking about as to how space and time are intertwined and really one thing, not two separate things. Okay, fourth point, and this will be the, I think the last one we'll do for this section of the video um, for relativity. It says the, for, uh, the mass of an object is going to increase as the velocity increases. And this is a kind of a weird statement. It says that basically the faster you go, the more massive you will become. And again, we don't, I say it's weird because we don't, in everyday context, we don't experience anything like this. Um, even, you know, we, we, at the high school, we have a lot of people who are involved in track and so forth. And a lot of those people are really good at what they do. They're, they're very fast. They can you know, just zip by on the track um, and uh, do a great job at running. None of them are going to approach, of course, any velocities that would cause any noticeable increase in mass and even um even the fastest things that humans have been able to build things like you know satellites spacecraft um one thing that's become one of the fastest human-made objects uh, in recent years is the parker solar probe and that's because it's been sent toward the sun and when you move toward the sun its gravitational field gets stronger as you get closer and therefore it accelerates you as you get closer and so it's actually been able to as the parker solar probe moved toward the sun over the past year or two um, it got tremendously fast as it approached the orbit it was going to uh, settle into. 
but even the speeds it was getting to, which would have been in the hundreds of thousands of kilometers um, per hour, uh, don't really still get across this idea of mass increasing as velocity increases. For, for you to see a significant and noticeable change in mass due to velocity increasing, you would need tremendous velocities, things that start to you know, become significant fractions of the speed of light, or even, of course, approaching the speed of light. And as you can see, like it says here, it says the, the curve of mass increase is asymptotic, meaning that as velocity gets closer to the speed of light, um, the mass is going to just keep getting higher and higher and higher incrementally. And what this, this actually kind of helps enforce that speed of light speed limit. Any normal object, meaning a, an object that's made of matter, so not energy, not like light itself, but any, like again, you know, like a rocket ship, a spaceship, anything like that. If you're trying to get it to accelerate closer and closer to the speed of light, half the speed of light, eight tenths speed of light, whatever, as it gets closer, 99%, 99.5%, its mass is actually just going to keep getting larger and larger and larger. And it's actually going to start to approach infinity which, you know, this causes some problems if you're trying to get to the speed of light because to move a mass, that requires energy. Your, your rocket ship, your spaceship that's, in, you know, becoming almost infinitely massive, therefore is also going to require a nearly infinite amount of energy to accelerate to that 100% of the speed of light, to match the speed of light. And that's just not going to happen. You can't have an infinite amount of energy. That breaks the laws of conservation of energy in the universe and of course, mass becoming infinite would also do the same thing. You, you, we have a law of conservation of mass as well. So you can't just generate new energy and mass from nothing. And that's what these situations would require. So that's kind of how this part of special relativity helps enforce, uh, helps enforce our first point of the speed of light being sort of the universal speed limit for matter and for energy too. Um, but what about light itself? Light obviously goes at the speed of light, at least if it's in a vacuum, if there's nothing to impede it. light Because light actually does slow down in different uh, types of matter, you know, glass will slow it down, water will slow it down, air will slow it down. But if, if speed of light in a vacuum, which again, three times 10 to the eighth meters per second, that's, that's how fast we're talking. Um, light can go at that speed because it has what we call zero rest mass. In other words, light doesn't have any mass of, it doesn't have any mass as an intrinsic property. It only has mass as a result of its motion. Um, and this kind of goes back to, again, in physics, if you've already taken it, one of the things you look at is momentum and momentum is equal to the mass of the object times its velocity. Um, but you, if an object has velocity or if energy has velocity, it's actually going to have momentum. And as a result, light can have momentum just due to the fact that it has velocity on its own. And again, I'm not doing a great job explaining why that is, but basically energy has zero rest mass but will have mass as a result of its motion. Um, and again, all energy will have to adhere to this speed of light, speed limit. So things like gravity. Gravity can exert itself as a form of energy, but gravitational energy can only travel at speed of light as well. Um, electromagnetic energy, which actually electromagnetic energy is, is um, you know, uh, it's transferred by photons anyway. So photons being a form of light particle form of light. It makes sense that it can't go faster than light either. Um, all right, so that will be the last part for this section of the video. I'm going to be working on the second part here in just a moment. And again, hopefully we'll get both of these parts uploaded pretty quickly this morning if I can get the files to go through without taking too long. All right, stick around for part two of relativity.